empower black men to live extraordinary lives. Shadow the stereotypes. Power black men. Power black men. Shadow the stereotypes. Power black men to live extraordinary lives. Shadow the stereotypes. Shadow the stereotypes. Power black men to live extraordinary lives. Welcome to Shatter the Stereotypes, where the intention is to empower black men to live extraordinary lives. This show is based on the simple idea that every black man is capable of creating inner peace, dynamic health, great relationships, and financial abundance. Therefore, we provide insights and strategies to educate, motivate, and inspire black men to reach their full potential and create the life of their dreams. So if you're ready for some high octane motivation and inspiration that supports and empowers you to live the life you were born to live, get ready to shatter the stereotypes so you can build a life that lights you up and positively impacts the world. So now let's shatter the stereotypes with your host, Coach Michael Taylor. Hello and welcome to Shadow the Stereotypes, where our intention is to empower Black men to live extraordinary lives. You see, there's never been a shortage of Black male role models. There's only been a lack of exposure of those role models. So the intention here is to showcase and highlight Black men who are doing remarkable things in the world. And my guest tonight is a man who is doing just that. His name is Ray Blanchard, and he is a master trainer. He's a coach. He's a therapist and he's a life architect. He's also the founder of the Launch Your Dream Coaching Program. So that definitely qualifies as doing remarkable things in the world. So without further ado, let's welcome Ray to the show. Hello, Ray, so glad to, you could join us. So how are you doing tonight? Great, Michael, it's great to see you again. Uh, missed you over the years, my brother. It's been a while, man, but you know, we, we, we're connected at the hip, right? The spiritual hip. We're, we're in this transformational process together. So I'm really looking forward to jumping into your work. But before we do, we're going to start off with a few icebreaker questions, okay? Yes, great. All right. So first of all, tell us where you're from and tell us a little bit about growing up. What was that like? Great question. I haven't uh, had anybody ask me that lately. I'm actually from St. Louis. Okay. Uh, I grew up prior to that in a small town in Mississippi. And my parents moved to St. Louis and my teenage years, I grew up there and then moved out to Oregon and California, the West Coast, and life took off from there. Uh, you know, so funny, someone was asking me about uh, my growing up and where I got some of my values and principles and the things that we teach. And I thought about my mom and uh, I was related, uh, uh, relating that to someone. And when I was first growing up, we lived on a, a farm, a huge farm. You know, my family owned farm, a carryover from the old days of slavery and family inheriting stuff. And in those days, we didn't have bathrooms. We had outhouses. Oh, yeah. And uh, a lot of people probably don't even know what that is. <laughs> and uh, in, in living in that kind of an environment, you'd have never thought that uh, me, my uh, siblings, and other relatives would have gone from there to some of my relatives being with friends of the president. And uh, we thought about writing a book from the outhouse to the White House. Mm. <laughs> So nice. maybe that's going to be our, our book. Uh, some of the lessons that mama taught us. There you uh, go. That, that take you to the top right now. Uh, you know, you adhere to those. But that's how I grew up. And, you know, in St. Louis area, I grew up in the edge of St. Louis, the, you know, right near Ferguson. You might have heard of the Michael Brown shooting and sure. death. So I, I'm familiar with all of that culture that those stomping grounds and went to a great university there, it's, uh, Washington University. But I learned the ropes of life in the in that area of St. Louis. Nice. Now, we're going to do some sentence completions, okay? So I just want you to complete these sentences. Number one, I really love to 
I really love to make a difference with people and watch people grow. Nice. My superpower is? My superpower is being real. Ooh, that's a superpower. That's a superpower. I am proud of? I am proud of my brothers and sisters who have taken on the challenges of life and become successful people like yourself and a number of other people that I'm really proud of. Life is? Life is full of challenges and opportunities. And it's about taking the opportunities you see in a timely manner. One thing I would like to change about the world is? One thing I would like to change about the world is the way people treat each other and honor each other. And last but not least, the future is? The future is bright with possibilities and innovation and uh, great challenges. The mm. future is very bright. Nice. So now I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself professionally. So share with the audience what you do. Well, as you have just said, I'm uh, a psychotherapist by trade and I own Blanchard Consulting Group. So my main focus is, is wisdom seekers, working with wisdom seekers and entrepreneurs who want to be transformational trainers and leaders and speakers who have impact and who can be visionary leaders in these challenging times. And uh, I'm passionate about human potential, personal growth, and what I call the hero's quest, the hero's journey. And um, I'm passionate about my family. Uh, my family, I have siblings and a whole bunch of nieces and nephews, and I'm Uncle Ray. <laughs> uh, a little uh, known fact about me is that um, I am genuine. I believe in authenticity, keeping it real, uh, letting people see who you are, your true character. And I work with people on bringing forth their true character so that they don't have to pretend to be who they already are. Mm. Right. and let that shine and build their dreams around that because that's where they get the greatest pop and the greatest mileage. Uh, these days, people are dealing with um, anxiety and I'm working on the whole concept of resiliency mm -hmm. and doing some work around that. Um, doing some uh, conscious media these days and releasing a new movie called Consider This, a new way of life around the kinds of things that we're gonna be talking about now. And um, I'm really just trying to make a, the biggest difference for people and offer people as much as they can take, put as much on the table as people want to consume uh, mm -hmm. so that people have a, a better opportunity to, to really flourish and thrive uh, because they deserve it. Nice. So I want to I want to begin with this question for you. What is your perception of the current condition of the world? How does Ray Blanchard see the world right now? Michael, that's a great question. The world, in my most idyllic view, is the world of compassionate giving people who really do care uh, about their brothers and sisters, about their neighbors, idyllic world. But in the everyday world, I'm bothered by the resurgence of racism. I'm bothered by the amount of deaths that we've seen happen in the last couple of weeks, in fact, around race. I'm bothered by people feeling like they need guns 
and they need to defend themselves and protect themselves and, and being walled up and disconnected from people. So I'm really concerned about people's interpretation of themselves in such a way that they live in fear rather than living in love and compassion. So the world I see is a world that is in discontent, but I also simultaneously see a world of, of, of loving, compassionate, uh, helping each other. And that's why I spend my life working on win-win strategies and win-win solutions for people. So with, with that being said, there are some people who are pretty pessimistic about the future while others are pretty optimistic about the future. So where do you fall on that spectrum between optimism and pessimism for the future in general? Where do you fall? Well, let me keep it real. <laughs> that some days I wake up, Michael, and I have to talk myself into being inspirational to myself and to other people because of all of the conversations and concerns around me. Uh, in, in the social sphere. Uh, but I'm an optimistic person. I believe in people deeply. And I believe in the goodness and the greatness of people, the magnificence of people, uh, the God-givenness of people, and the divine nature of people. And I won't rest uh, without... Uh, endeavoring to bring that forward and to bring people out of the uh, despondency that sometimes people fall into. So I, you know, I get to talk myself into uh, stepping it up and lifting my head up too. You know, I teach this, so I got to walk the talk. And life these days present to me all kinds of challenges where I got to walk the talk. Yeah. in order to just thrive in these challenging times. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's real. <laughs> absolutely. So I have come to believe that there are only two things that will cause a person to want to change or transform themselves. Number one is pain. And number two is what I call divine discontent, which is simply an internal feeling that something's just not right in our lives. So I'm curious, what caused you to begin your inner journey of transformation? Was it pain or was it divine discontent? I think it was a little of both, actually. Uh, in my early years, I was struggling with science and religion. <laughs> my, I grew up as a, as a Christian in a very religious family but I was going to school and studying science and I was torn between that paradox of science and religion and nobody around me could uh, help me answer that question and resolve that. So I was in a pain and I wanted to study uh, myself and people around me and see uh, what was this uh, dissonance all about and try to understand uh, the world and, and give it meaning. And uh, out of that discontent and that dissonance myself, the pain of that drove me to, uh, to study more, to pursue more. And I just happened to you know, fall into the right places at the right time and people took me under their wings and which opened up a whole new world for me. And that's when the dis divine discontent kicked back in, in which I reconnected with something that I was about, even as a little boy at seven or eight years old, of knowing a purpose in life. And I don't know how I knew that, but I knew that. And I tended to, I guess I forgot about it, but as people took me under their wings and started to teach me, that opened back up again. And from that point forward, I could very well say that I stepped into this, what you're calling the divine discontent, uh, what I frame it as uh, my calling and my purpose. 
and and then and looking out through the the those lenses at the world, it became clear to me that uh, the world was a hell no to me. I I ain't gonna uh, stand for the way I see things uh, uh, coming down. Hell no. My calling was about doing something about what I saw happening in the world around me. And that drives me to this very day. Yeah. Uh, fulfilling that purpose. Mm. Hmm. Now, I define transformation as the process through which we transform ourselves from who we thought we were to who we were born to be. How would you define transformation? I define transformation as stepping out of your conditioning of who you were conditioned to be and who people talked you into thinking who you were and what you had to settle for and stepping into your divine purpose and really getting centered into that. Once you get centered into that, you can never go back. Yeah. And life will not be the same for you again. And you'll step into that place where you could do no other. And that's what I call transformation. Yeah, yeah, I know that feeling well. Now, one of the things you and I have in common is our participation in a program called LifeSpring. So I'm curious, first of all, how did you get involved with LifeSpring yourself? Uh, very uh, great question. I moved from St. Louis out to the University of Oregon to go to school, graduate school, and finishing a doctoral program there. I took a, a leave of absence and I went down to Big Sur, California at Esalen Institute and I studied with a guy named Michael Murphy and the Aikido master, George Leonard. They took me under their wings. And when I went back to the university, I didn't fit in. And I heard about a, a training seminar that people were going up to Portland to do from Eugene, Oregon. So I went up or on a weekend and, and took a seminar. And I was very skeptical at first. I sat back in the back row wondering, what is this stuff that people are talking about? And I was sitting there with my arms folded and, and what do you have to teach me? What do you have to offer me? All this stuff you guys are talking about, I've, I've heard it before, is what I thought. After a couple of days, I began to think, well, maybe I don't know all of this. By the third or fourth day, I was in wow. By the last day, I was literally in tears of joy about a new discovery. And I wanted to dedicate my life to what I was seeing and witnessing. Wow. Because I saw people transforming literally and making shifts in a few days time that it would have taken me a year to two years of working with people in therapy settings and I said, this is for me. I just wanted to be more of that. But there were no black people uh, in there except me. And I thought, well, where are the other people <laughs> that look like me? And at first, it, uh, I, I began to think that there's not going to be a place for me in this. But someone who is who partnered up with me in that particular seminar said, no, you've got what it takes. And they saw something in me that I had not seen in myself. Mm. And that pushed me forward. And from then on, I decided to give up everything that I was doing up to that point, even my doctoral degree and teaching at the university and set off to do this work, wow. which has taken me around the world and living in other countries. And I, I tell you, it's been uh, uh, 
the ride of a lifetime. That's amazing. So I want, I want to share my story real quickly of how I got into life spring because I was in a really dark place. I'd gone through a divorce, bankruptcy, a foreclosure. I was in a really bad spot. And I was sitting in my office at work and I had a USA Today newspaper. And in the center of the newspaper, there was this big picture of a cruise ship going across both pages. And the headline said something like things to do for the summer or something like that. And so because of my depression, I said, you know, maybe I'll go on a cruise, right? To, to kind of alleviate some of the pain I was in. And at the very bottom, of this two page thing was a little two sentence blurb that said something to the effect of, are you ready to take your life on? And there was a phone number. Something pulled me to that number. Mm -hmm. Don't know what, well, I do know what now, but something pulled me to that number. And I said, I don't know what that is, but I'm, I'm gonna call it. So I, I kept the number, I, I set up the cruise. What, went on the cruise or whatever, or set up to go to the cruise. And so I took that number one night and I called them and I got an answering machine. This, this woman's voice came on the answering machine and she's one of these high energy, hi, glad you called. <laughs> it's just, it's just <laughs> real energetic, high energy. I'm like, oh my gosh, what in the hell am I getting myself into, right? So we played phone tag for a while. Finally, I got her on the phone and it was Lisa Kalman. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh it my yeah, it was Lisa Kalman. So anyway, she invites me to this guest event. So I go to this thing. And unlike yourself, I sat at the front and I'm listening. I'm like, what is this about? Don't know what it is, but I just, I just want to listen. And as the people were sharing about this experience they had, there was something in me that said, I want whatever it is they got. <laughs> I knew nothing about what it was. But that, that part of me just said, you just need to do it. And so I signed up for the training. And um, well, actually, another quick story. When I was signing up for the training, I'm, I asked them what date the training was. And they gave me the date. And it just so happens that the date coincided with the date of my cruise. And so I, I tell Lisa, I said, look, I'm committed to the training. Here's my check. But I can't do it this time. I'll do it next time. And Lisa said something that just shook me to my core. She mm. said, look, Michael, your training has already started. And then she said, who would you need to be to make this work out so that you can not only go on your cruise, but you can be in this upcoming training? Now, actually, I got a little ticked off because it almost sounded like a, like a sales pitch, right? Yeah. But um, I said, lady, look, you got my money. I'm going to be there, but I just can't go right now. She says, Mike, I just want you to think about it. Who would you need to be for both things to work out? And I left. They had my check and I went home. But when I got home, I couldn't get that question out of my head because at first the question didn't make sense to me. What do you mean? Who do I need to be? Right? Mm, yeah. But I, I, I couldn't get the question out of my mind. And I started thinking, I said, wow maybe I'm supposed to be in that training. And so I called the cruise agency and we, I was able to move things around and boom, there I am in the training <laughs> and the rest is history. But uh, the Life train, Life Spring trainings by far is the most impactful uh, experience I've ever had in my life. And I've done a bunch of trainings, <laughs> a <laughs> bunch of trainings. But it was that training that really woke me up, if you will, to who Michael Taylor really was. And it was just, it was just a powerful, powerful experience that I, I wish every human being could have that experience of tapping into who they truly are. Now, with that being said, I, I want to kind of touch bases on something that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so as a man who happens to be Black, I'm just curious, how do you deal with the negative media generated narratives about Black men? right? Because you know what we're inundated with. So how do you deal with that? That's a great question. Uh, uh, going back to what you were saying that Lisa Kalman asked you, who would you need to be? A really powerful question. And I can relate to that because someone uh, asked me when I was going through all of my 
circumstances and considerations and difficulties. Uh, how could you have it all? Yeah. And who would you need to be to have it all? <laughs> that was a powerful question. And I have to say that Lisa Kalman and all the people in those days, they were great enrollers. They were, they were not <laughs> salespeople, but they were enrollers because they knew how to ask the central question, the right questions that would get you stirred. And you would have to be with that and sit with that question for a while. Yeah. Uh, and who would you need to be is a great question in answering how I deal with the socialized racism and the systemic racism. Uh, I always have to ask myself the question, who would I need to be to get through this? Who would I need to be to be who I'm going to be rather than letting other people run my life and living in somebody else's narrative? Because much of our lives, my life, I lived in somebody else's narrative and I didn't even know it was a narrative. Yeah. It was just uh, the way it was. And I took life uh, as it came and considered myself lucky and thankful if something worked out good. But I didn't have a sense that I could be the causal force of my life. And the life spring trainings and the trainings like that opened my eyes to that, opened my eyes to being a force of nature and realizing that not only did I have a gift, but I could marshal that gift and leverage that gift to my advantage. And no matter what people said around me and naysayers, uh, about what Black people can do and what Black people can't do, I persisted because when I stepped into the training arena, this world that you're talking about, as I said, there were no other Black people. Uh, I think I was the first one who was stepping up on the big stage doing this kind of work. And when you showed up in the training, I was your trainer, I think. And uh, I can imagine for you what that must have been like. Because when I stepped in the training, they, there were no black people, there were no leaders. And when I wanted to be a leader, everybody assumed that I wouldn't be a trainer, but I would be some kind of assistant. Mm. They assumed that I would be working in the office or back office somewhere. <laughs> they assume that even though I had a PhD, I would not be one of the people who would be one of the leaders and become vice president of that organization and head of training for all trainers. I don't think that was in the cards. And I had to continuously ask myself, who would I need to be and how would I need to show up in order to get to where I know that I want to be? And I think that was a huge question. And the way I dealt with it is I learned very quickly to enroll people, learn enrollment skills. I also learned to make connections. I also learned to make myself accessible and available and how to connect with a variety of people without selling out. And I'll say that again, how to connect with a lot of people without selling out. Because many people, I would say many Black people, think that if you're going to connect with a lot of people who are not like you, you need to sell out something about yourself to connect to them and right. meet their approval. But how to connect with them without selling out for approval? I mm -hmm. think that was the biggest quest yeah. that I had. Now, see, because the amazing thing about this story, if you will, <laughs> is when I did the training, as I mentioned, I was the only Black person in the, base, in the basic training. And after I did the training, the basic training, 
I was kind of on the fence about going further. Now, for most of my life, I've been the only black person, right, in a lot of environments. As a matter of fact, I wrote an entire book called The Cure for Onlyness, A Black Man's Guide to Joy, Passion, and Purpose. And I talk about, you know, what it's like being the only person of color in certain environments and, and how to navigate through that. Mm -hmm. um, but within the Life Spring uh, community, you know, I'm thinking, do I want to do this thing? And then you show up. And I watched you and I watched how powerfully you commanded the room. I watched how you showed up. And I went, that's a guy I can follow. Mm -hmm. This is a guy that I can follow. I want to do what he's doing. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to become a life spring trainer, but through seeing you and your example, mm. I simply decided I'll do my own thing. And I became a motivational speaker. I became an author. I became a TV show host, partly because I saw you as the model of who I could become as a black man. Wow. Because you were the... Honestly, you were the first black man that I saw in the personal development space that, as you mentioned, didn't sell out. You were just being authentic in who you were. And it resonated. I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's a guy I want to follow. So that's why I've been so excited and wanted to have you on the platform to say, number one, thank you for how you show up in the world because it inspired me, <laughs> it inspired me. So thank you for that. Wow. So that completes, that completes a circle for me. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah, you know, that comes full circle and now you're interviewing me and I'm on your show. <laughs> but, you know, I guess every one of us who are in this work, I think I speak for you as well, the legacy you want to leave is uh, someone taking up where you left off or someone following in your footsteps that validates what you were up to. Yeah. That lets you know that what you were up to was worthwhile and it was a, a loss because you can get lost in the noise and confusion of things and question yourself. But when yeah. somebody else takes it up and takes it further, that's when it validates that your life was well lived. So Absolutely. Yeah. I and really so, appreciate you sharing that with me. Yeah, it, and, and it, it comes back to what you were saying earlier about calling and purpose. So I recognize that you gave me the inspiration to follow, connect with, and become my calling, become who I was meant to be. So you, you're leading by example. Now, with that being said, one of the lessons that I learned in Life Spring that was so powerful for me was this whole concept called the drift and how the drift is a metaphor for society. So talk a little bit about that. Share with the audience that metaphor and why it's so powerful. You know, so funny. Uh, we're right here in the midst of that ship being stuck in the Suez Canal. <laughs> and I was in a conversation only a week ago with a couple of philosophers talking about this concept of the drift and they had not heard it expressed that way before. And bless their hearts, <laughs> they wanna do great things they want to make a difference with this kind of work that you and I are talking about. And they brought up the question about how are we gonna change society? How are we gonna change uh, to have more diversity, uh, equity, and uh, inclusion and social justice? How are we gonna turn that around? And I brought up the subject, I said, well, that's like trying to turn a big ship of state that's out in the ocean 
and you're just a swimmer paddling beside this big ship of state, trying to turn this whole ship of state by just your effort in the ocean. Mm. Literally impossible. And, 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 and I say that to say, we're in this drift, this slipstream of consciousness, this way of being, this way of understanding that is like a, a, a drift in the water. And this whole ship of state is cruising right along in that direction. And the drift that we're in is kind of like a collective consciousness. For instance, there's a narrative or a drift about uh, who it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a human being, what it is to be black, what it is to be poor, what it is to be wealthy. There's an understanding that's below the surface that is not obvious to us. That's like the deep slipstream, the deep current that's going on. So that's like the drift is going on. It was going on before you got here. It might not have been as obvious. And you just were born into it. You just stepped into it. And you just started uh, going in that direction because the forces were driving in that direction. So we're in that force. And we struggle to try to not be in that force, but we don't know how to get out of it because it's so powerful. And it, I call it the collective consciousness. And another word, the drift. There's a drift going on. So how do you shift the drift? How do you flip the script? How do you uh, do that? Uh, I would say that you need to learn how to take a stand in the middle of the drift without trying to fight the drift. Because fighting the drift, you just get sucked into the current. And you can't fight it. You've heard the expression, what you resist persists. You try to resist it, you get sucked right into it. But you can't push the river, it flows by itself. So as you could uh, flow with the river and get out of the resistance, then you can elevate yourself to a place called not related to the drift, but you can start to have a vision for a possibility, not in contradiction to what's going on, not in contradiction to the drift, but have a vision of possibility that's literally independent that's connected to your calling, connected to who you are, and then take a stand for that. And as you take a stand for that, you're already bucking the drift without trying to buck the drift. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing because when, when I did the training, the basic, and, that, and they were talking about that concept, and I, I, I'll never forget, I went home and I, I, I couldn't stop thinking about it because what I realized was that I was so stuck in this societal drift saying, I was supposed to have the house, the wife, the 2.5 kids and all of that, and I would be happy. Well, I had done all of that and I was absolutely miserable. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I was absolutely miserable. So within the, the context of life spring and, and the whole idea of me being willing to take a stand for my life, and not just go with the flow, but to figure out what it was that Michael Taylor was really all about. Who am I? I was like, wow. I mean, it, it was profound. It was, it was life-changing. Now, with that being said, another lesson that I learned in Life Spring that I want you to speak on is this whole idea of being 100% responsible for your lives turning out the way you wanted to versus being a victim. Can you talk a little bit about the power of taking responsibility for your life? Yeah, that, that's a good uh, connection segue from the drift because the drift in a way uh, sets you up to be a victim. Uh, 
have you ever, uh, and most people who are listening, have you ever had the experience of that? You're trying your best, you're spinning your wheels and ending up in the same place. How you try to get somewhere and you end up in the same place of where you started. You try to succeed and you're still just mediocre, still just getting by. So no, no matter how much your efforts, you're still just getting by. That's what the drift is like. And if you don't watch yourself, you can start to let that get to you. And you can feel like you're a victim of your circumstances. And your circumstances then tend to dictate who you are, what you could do, and then if you ever want to do something else, you then start to ask your circumstances. <laughs> you know, is it all right that I do this? Do I have what it takes to do that? Uh, do I have permission to go where I want to go? Uh, do what I want to do? And you start consulting your circumstances for everything. So in a way, your circumstances are, are still the, the, the dominating force of your life. Now, when we talk about responsibility, uh, most people don't want to take responsibility because of their understanding of responsibility. See, we grow up, most of us grew up in the understanding of responsibility is that it's a burden. Mm. Uh, responsibility is I'm the blame for something or it's heavy or it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm I take credit for it if I'm responsible or blame or shame and guilt. So responsibility become like a yoke or a burden and it doesn't work for people. So what I like to have people think about uh, an analogy is like you, you think about a billiard table and all the balls on the table represent events of your life. And some people say, well, I'm responsible for that one, but I'm a victim of that one. Mm. And I'm responsible for that one, but not that one. And so responsibility becomes this selective thing and it's about the events of your life. But I then want to coach people to, well, responsibility is not even about the balls on the table. It's not even about the events. It's about the table itself. Mm. Wow. What holds everything. So you can be responsible as a way of being, not a responsible for this or for that. It's like in your nature, be responsible as a way of being. When I got that, it altered my life because I grew up in the South where people burn crosses on our yard. I grew up in uh, St. Louis where there were not many opportunities uh, or getting bank loans or living in neighborhoods and, and so forth and so on. So I grew up in that and, and racism and I didn't feel like I was responsible for any of it. I had a good story that said that I'm a victim of all of it. But when I got this about responsibility the way I'm talking about it, it suddenly dawned on me that I can operate from a place of responsibility and be responsible for all of it. Responsible, not specifically for this or for that, but responsible, period. Out of that, my life completely shifted so that no matter whether I'm in Malaysia or whether I'm in Tokyo, whether I'm right here in San Antonio or wherever I am, no matter what situation I'm in, I could show up how I show up. It's up to me. And if it's to be, it's up to me. It's not up to you. It's not up to my circumstances. It's not up to anybody or anything. It is my choice. It's up to me how I show up in the midst of anything. And that's why you could say uh, how you could be responsible for it all. Uh, yeah. in the midst of all of it, be responsible. Yeah. And another thing I learned was that responsibility is simply the ability to respond. The ability to respond to that which is going on around me. And that was a, 
again, one of those lessons that was, was life-changing for me. Now, as a man who happens to be Black, <laughs> I know that in my, my very first book I wrote, it was called Brothers Are You Listening? A Success Guide for the New Millennium. And the first chapter was called the that's what white people do mentality. And in that chapter, I was talking about how most of my life, I was accused of being a sellout for some of the things that I chose to do. And I still get pushback sometimes from some blacks because of my optimism and because of the stand that I take for being responsible for my life and, and not believing that anything outside of me can keep me from what I want to accomplish or create in my life. So my question is how do we impart this idea that being responsible isn't denying that racism exists and, and, and all the external things. We're not denying those things, but we're simply saying I'm responsible for my life turning out the way I want it to. And it's, for me, I don't want to say that I've been lonely, but I've felt alone at times because of how I think, because of this idea that I have that I'm, I'm responsible for my, for my life 100%. So can you, can you shed some light on the viewers in terms of taking responsibility, especially if you happen to be black watching this, taking responsibility for your, for your life is not denying that racism and stuff exists. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, this is a big one. Uh, I, I'm really glad you're bringing this one up because if I could do anything for people in general, particularly our black brothers and sisters, I would like to see if we can help bust that one up. Because, you know, like in growing up, if you were doing your best and being smart, people would say, well, you're arrogant and you're acting too smart. Or you're acting like you're white or you're acting like this. So in order to not get rejected, we sometimes uh, hold back and do a little less. Not that we couldn't be greater, but we're afraid of the pushback or the backlash of standing out. There are too many of our young boys and girls and Black people whose dreams have been uh, uh, eclipsed and whose success have been undermined and been told that you dream too big and that you want too much, or you're not like us, or you're uh, leaving your peoples. And um, if you yeah. really go for it and, and achieve that much, you, you've left home, you've left your people. And who do you think you are now? And uh, you're not like us anymore, or you don't talk like us anymore, or you're talking all those concepts that white people talk or other people talk. You're not talking like us right now. I think that whole litany of conversation has gotten in our way and, and, and really gotten to us in our soul and where we uh, be less than and we play less than who we can be. I want to uh, uh, connect that back to victim and responsibility again and, and just say this. Uh, it's who you're being, not just what you're doing because we uh, 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 become do monsters. We do and do and do and do and think that's the name of the game. That is half of the game. The rest of the game is who you're being underneath it all. You've heard the expression that a context is more powerful than the content mm -hmm. because a context dictates what content can exist. It's like a desert is a context, and it dictates what can live there, like a willow cannot live there, because the environment, the context is not conducive to willows. And a rainforest is a context, and it's very powerful. It dictates what can live there. A cactus cannot live there, because 
it is a context that doesn't support that content. So when you think about the content like poverty, content like failure, content like disappointment, it is not that you're not trying. It's the context that is creating that content. And that context is something that is not only external to us, like an environment, outer environment, that context is our inner environment for ourselves personally. So shifting that context uh, allows us to dictate what content can be there. So for all of the people who get worried about who are going to criticize you, who is going to judge you, who's going to push back on you, uh, by shifting your inner conversation, like you say, shift your mind, you shift your life, shift your energy, you shift your life, shift your being, you shift your life. By shifting that, you dictate then what content and who show up around you. Yes. And that alters your life because you dictate who show up in your world. Now, I just want to say to all of the people who have lived a little less than who you can be in order to satisfy and to belong, you're cheating yourself. Like three of the biggest things that must uh, give people fulfillment is one is a sense of identity. Who am I really? Like you started to ask. Second is a sense of belonging. We need to belong. And a third is a connection with community. So we need to endeavor to find out more about who we are, be in a connection with people of like mind so that you can have a sense of belonging and have a connection with a tribe, a group of people that are of a mind, growth mindset. Yeah. That, and that will allow you to thrive. For all of you who have really had trouble with that, you will get a lot of support, but it's not always easy. You've got to take that first step to take a risk to step out there and look different. And don't be afraid to look different. All great people have been willing to look different and to be different. And so don't be afraid to be different. Absolutely. And, and one thing that I've always adhered to is sometimes you have to be willing to disappoint another in order to be true to yourself. Mm, absolutely. You got to be with like, you got to you got to like Fritz Perls used to say, I didn't come into this world to live up to your expectations or to make you happy. Yeah. You came absolutely. into this world to live your, your your purpose, your vision, your dreams. And if by chance we meet, that's good. If by chance I make you happy, you make me happy. That's great. But if I don't, then so be it. And you've got to be willing to pay the price in order not to pay the price. Mm -hmm. I'll say that again. You've yeah. got to be willing to pay the price in order not to pay the price. Because if you're not willing to pay the price now, you'll pay later and you'll pay with interest. So. <laughs> Absolutely. So another thing I want you to touch on real quick Time flies when you're having fun. Are you okay with time? Oh, yeah, I'm good. Oh, okay, good. This is, this is juicy. I love doing this. <laughs> so I want you to touch base on the importance of having a vision. Now, I'm, I've always been a goal setter, writing down my goals. And, and it's amazing how few people are willing to even create a vision for themselves. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of having a vision? Yeah, I like to talk about that because goals and visions are not the same thing you know i do this piece on launch your dream design your dream and launch your dream workshop and i get into that a lot first of all i would say that if you want to have the secret key here it starts with a purpose okay purpose then allows you to have vision and then you line your actions up with that. 
you'll be successful. So purpose is your reason for being. What gives meaning to your life? The reason you're here. What your life is all about and was meant to be. If you have the courage to step into that and sacrifice a few little conveniences and ask yourself that big question and take a risk to step into it, then you can then become a visionary. You can begin to see what's possible. And then you begin to see what others don't see. Mm. And then you can set goals, milestones along the way. And I want to differentiate vision from goals because many people think that vision is just a big goal. Uh, and, and, and other goals are just smaller goals. That's not the way it is. Okay. okay. Goals are like results. They're like measure measures. You get to a certain place. Vision is not a goal. It's what drives you in life, the vision of possibility. Like Martin Luther King. Let's go back to him. He was a visionary. He had a vision that may not even get accomplished in his lifetime. Mm. But it was worth giving his life to. A vision of possibility that may not even happen in his lifetime. So Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a goal. <laughs> he said, I have a dream. I have a dream of a bigger possibility. Uh, little black girls, little white girls holding hands of something unprecedented, maybe even beyond his lifetime, but that gave him juice that, that, that could uh, match up to what the purpose of his life was about. A, a, a dream or vision that matched up to his deeper purpose, that <laughs> give your life over to that and let it drive you and let it inspire you. And then set some measurements along the way, some goals along the way. Like Martin Luther King did, he set some goals for voter registration and things like that. So set some goals along the way that would help you manifest a vision. And even if it doesn't happen in your lifetime, it was worth living. And maybe somebody else can take it up from there. But it gives you juice. So don't be afraid to dream. Yeah. Dream big. Yeah. Go big. So, so what distinction would you make between a purpose and a vision? They are so closely related that it's almost difficult to distinguish them. But to just speak into it a little bit, a purpose is your God's calling. A purpose is your reason to be on the planet. Uh, what you're here to fulfill. Mm. And you may not know that. You might have to do a little searching, a little soul searching. And if you can't find it, make up one. Like a purpose for your life. What your life, the point your life is going to be about. Yeah. And once you get clear what your life is going to be about, then you can start to visualize paint a picture of what it would manifest as or what uh, would you be doing, who would you be being, how would you be carrying on your life, who would you be carrying it on with. And so start painting a picture like that and that becomes like a vision. But that vision is really to serve that whole point of your life. You know, if you go back to the trainings that you did, remember there used to be a big sign in the front of the room. <laughs> what and, and you remember? Not, what are you pretending not to know? What are you know? pretending not to know? Yeah. We're pretending not to know our purpose and our vision. Now, over the years, as I started designing my own work, my own trainings, after I left LifeSpring, I changed the sign. And I changed the sign to 
what point is your life making now? Mm. Because people tend to be right about this and right about that. So what point are you making? Yeah. What point is your life making? Because your life is making a point. You're making a point called, my life is making a point called, men are not uh, sensitive. Your life is making the point called, uh, black people are going to be poor. Your life is making a point called, we got to struggle. Your life is making a point called, life is unfair. Your life is making a point called, uh, this or that. So your life is always making a point. So what point is your life making now? So if you don't know what point your life is to make, make up one. <laughs> and then whatever that point is, start to visualize the outcropping of that or what would it start to look like and who you would be, be and how you would be carrying it out and then create a vision out of that. Nice. And so last but not least, in creating an extraordinary life, I want to get your feeling, your perception, your value that you put on spirituality and how important is spirituality in creating an extraordinary life? Because when I first did the trainings, I was actually an atheist and I was driven by science. I was driven by, okay, I needed to fit logically in my intellect. And so I, I struggled with the whole idea of spirituality at the beginning. Um, I have since evolved to my own understanding. So from your perspective, Ray, how important is spirituality? Well, it is central. It is the center point of my life. Uh, first of all, I grew up as a Christian and I drifted away from it. And I got like many people into science and I didn't think much about my spiritual life. I got too busy trying to make it, trying to do this, trying to do that. And I lost touch with uh, my spiritual uh, underpinnings to some degree. But you know, as you grow up in that world, you don't lose certain values that you're taught. You may not think about them every day, but you don't lose it. And over time, with some maturity, a few life disappointments and struggles that I've gone through, life wasn't always easy. There were times where I was on my knees and asking for guidance. And I didn't know where to ask for that guidance. And where you find yourself alone and you find that the only answer to, if there is a divine, if there is a God, is there a, 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 a guidance somewhere? Uh, touch me and let me know. And I've gone through many, many moments of that. And also asking myself, why this? And why that in my life? But the thing that gives me the greatest peace and the thing that gives me the greatest comfort is to know that I'm not alone. And that gives me a sense of companionship and partnership and meaning to my life. And I think that everyone is in search of that at the deepest level. The, you know, whether we get it from our ancestors and whether we get it from our parents or peers, whatever they taught us, uh, the teachings themselves are not it because that can become dogma. But if you could get to the center of your deeper question of what am I about? Who are we? I think you will get to a sense of there's a divine purpose to it all yeah. and a divine essence of it all, no matter what you choose to call it. And 
I'm not trying to preach it, what anyone should call it, but don't ignore it because without it, your life is lost. Yeah. And yeah. there's no uh, rudder. There's no North Star yeah. or compass. And I think that's what we're all about is being true to that. Yeah, and I think it's important for us individually to go on our own journey to connect to that which is greater than ourselves. As mentioned, I was a former atheist and, and, and I could argue with the best of them about why I didn't believe you know, this thing existed. But through my own experience, my own connecting to something greater than myself, which I choose to call divine intelligence, it was, I've had several transcendent experiences where I have absolutely no question in my mind or my heart that there is something I'm connected to that is divine. Mm -hmm. um, and it, as you mentioned, it is, it is the essence of my life. It is, it is everything that I'm about is a reflection of that connection to that essence. So that's, it's what lights me up. It's what drives me. It is that connection to source um, that has given me, I think, the passion, the, the patience, the perseverance to do what I'm doing. Um, I'm, I'm not... Play. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not arrogant enough to think that I'm just this really smart guy that's, you know, there's something much, much bigger than me. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> you know? That would be a little arrogant. Huh? <laughs> to well, you, know, bigger... you know, Michael, uh, I can think of three, uh, three or more things. One is when I was about seven years old. I was in church and they used to have you get baptized. Uh, in Which I hated. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, you just sit on this uh, row of benches, young kids, until you got the spirit, and then you could declare that you were ready to be baptized. We used to say, "I was sitting on the mourner's bench," and until you declare that you're uh, you were you accepted Christ as your Savior and you're ready to be baptized. I can tell you this: I sat there for months. It seemed like forever. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then one day, it was one day, I had the experiences of overwhelming light. I can't explain it. It was like I was in a bubble. It's like in light. And all I knew is that it touched me so deeply I could weep. And that was my first overwhelming experience of being connected with something that my parents and everybody talked about, but I never understood. Yeah. But it was a direct experience. That came back profoundly again in different ways. But when I was, like you say, going through those trainings, I remember going through the second level, the advanced training. And on the last day, I was sitting in this training room and the room was filled with light and I could see auras of people all around me and again I just wept because in that moment it was like validation I knew and I knew I knew that there was something greater and that what my life was to be about and I think the other thing that uh, touches me is when I was helping support my brother through his sickness and ultimate death, there were times where it was inconvenient. And then I would just put that out of the way. And then uh, after a while, there was this almost a calm silence of gratefulness, of thankfulness gratitude to not have it be about me mm. but to the gratitude of just being there for another person or something beyond myself yeah all of those connect and i think that's what the greater self the servant self for something greater than yourself. Yeah. Wow. It makes it all make sense. 
Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, <laughs> as mentioned, you know, life spring was the most profound experience I had. And, and as a matter of fact, during my advanced course training, uh, when we declared our contract, which you obviously know what that's about. Um, so for those of you who are listening, we declare contract as it's a statement of who I, I chose to be. And, and, and my contract was, I am a powerful, courageous, fearless leader. But there's a process that we had to go through, which I can't disclose. But during this process, when I made that declaration, I was surrounded by friends and, and participants in this training. But when I said it, everyone that was around me told me this afterwards, that when I said it, my voice changed and they said my body literally got hot to the touch. And there was this experience that this energy in me that just sort of, it wasn't Michael that was saying this. It was this energy that said, I am, and it's this power just came out of me. It's like, whoa, it was so profound. And in that moment, I was touched by something. <laughs> Okay, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but that was a divine energy that permeated my being and it expressed itself in its fullest, whatever. And it was so powerful. Oh my gosh, it was, in fact, I still have my contract 30 years later that uh, I wrote that, I wrote down it was so powerful. So right as we wind down here, man. Whew. Yeah, that's, want, that's, that's like big time. Yeah. You know, I, know, I know that experience and you know I taught that class for many years and and I and I watch people I, I experienced it myself but I watch people get to that moment there's a moment and like you were saying you couldn't just make that up yeah you couldn't just of course those are words that anybody knows but they didn't all come together perfectly align and align with what you were going through and experiencing at the moment, at the right timing, yeah. uh, as when it really came to you. It's like, the, you know, we learned first there was the word and the word was with him and the word was him. Yeah. Let there be light and there is light. We're made in the image of that, the word. So we have the ability to step into a space and be the word of our own very being. Yes. And that's in the alignment with the divine being. In a way, we're the mouthpiece saying it, but it is not just the mouthpiece saying it. It is the divine saying it with us and through us. As and us. all the elements align up perfectly right. Yeah. And then it is beyond yourself it is includes yourself, but it's beyond yourself. And from then on, you can write it, you can write it down, but the writing of it down is written in your being. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Every Forever. cell in my body, every, I mean, it was just. Forever. Oh yeah, yeah, so transformational. So now I wanna, cause we've kind of summarized in this conversation the keys to creating an extraordinary life. And notice I didn't put a number like there's five keys, there's 10 keys, because I think there's an infinite amount of keys <laughs> that you can access to create an extraordinary life. But we shared some information and some insights that I hope can inspire you to, first of all, recognize that it's possible for you to create an extraordinary life. It is absolutely mm -hmm. possible, but you will need some help. You will need some support. And programs like we mentioned, uh, LifeSpring, of course, Ray, I want you to share some of the offerings that you have that can support people in transforming themselves. So share some of the things that you do. Well, one of the things that I do is I do uh, some individual coaching with people, which is on my website. People can take sessions with me. And I uh, like to say that I don't have a philosophy, fixed philosophy. I have some opinions. <laughs> <laughs> and my opinions are, are, you know, are trained opinions and educated opinion. They're not like just making up BS. 
So I work with people around uh, states of being and who they're being and shifting their states of being. So that's one of the things I do. The other thing I do is I have a workshop called Design Your Dream. It's a webinar and uh, it leads to a, a full day experience called Launch Your Dream. Because not only do you need to get into the state of being, of being a visionary, you need to do some executionary steps to actually get it there. And uh, so that you can launch it. So I work with people on that. But other than that, these days I'm creating, I'm working with some other partners. We're getting ready to launch uh, a new movie called Consider This. It's a movie that uh, encourages people to consider the kind of thinking we're talking about as a way of life, as a way of living. And uh, in the movie, there are some great uh, people that you know, Jack Canfield, uh, you know, you a lot of people have seen the movie The Secret, or they've read Chicken Soup for the Soul, or Men Are From Mars, or Men Are From Venus. Some of the other uh, people that I associate with people in my life uh, are in the uh, in the movie, uh, and we're gonna ready to launch that. We're collecting uh, bits and pieces of the talents and uh, words from some of these master trainers, uh, master leaders, and we're putting it in a, a movie form. So it's not just talking heads. We spent some time with teenagers who were bullied and teenagers who were bullies and um, that have gone through some of the trainings and transformed their lives uh, such that they're no longer bullies or bullied, but they're taking their philosophy that we've talked about and they've altered their lives and their leaders themselves now. So we're doing a movie because a lot of people may not ever get to go to trainings, but they can see a movie and that can maybe open some doors and open some keys uh, for them to uh, take the next step for, their, for themselves. So that's what I'm doing. I also train trainers to be public speakers and, and uh, trainers like we talked about uh, who conduct breakthrough work. So that work I'm doing called Train Up, Train Up. In fact, you can look it up, trainup.com, gotrainup.com. That's what it's, the site, gotrainup.com. Or you can uh, find me on rayblanchard.com and see some of the things that I'm doing. But I guess the most important thing I'm doing now is I'm concerned about bringing forth ancient wisdoms to people in a new frame where they could have access on a practical level and grow at their own pace with some virtual work as well as in-person work, in training room work, <clears throat> and mentoring some people towards being the great leaders that they can be. So look pretty soon for a whole package of new things that we're going to be releasing um, called, uh, under the name called Up In. Like Up In, Disrupt, but also Up In, the upper end, Up In. So it's going to be the Up In package Nice. Uh, uh, work that we're going to do that's coming outstanding outstanding so now i want to give you an opportunity to share any final closing thoughts ray whatever's on your heart to share with the audience after our conversation tonight uh yes one of the things that always stuck with me as i was uh, going through college university i was a uh, uh, a fellowship person and John Danforth had a statement that says, aspire nobly, adventure daringly, and serve humbly. Put those together. And I say, aspire nobly, go for the most noble, exceptional dream that 
give you a sense of meaning. And that's the true joy of life, to be used by something larger than yourself and to give your life over to it and to take risks, adventure daringly, learn more than what's in your backyard, go outside and let some people take you under their wings. Don't be a know-it-all. Mm. Let people take you under their wings and teach you and be coachable, be a learner a continuous learner and coachable. Allow people who know far more than you to help mold you and do it with grace and graciousness and come back around and give it away and serve with humility and uh, know that uh, it's not just you and you can't do it alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Ray, I, I, I can't express in words, man, how joyful I feel right now. Um, again, I don't believe in accidents. Everything happens for a reason. And as you mentioned, we've kind of circled back around uh, to reconnect. Um, but like I said, you, you have been a contribution to my life. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for, for leading and for, for, for opening that door and for challenging me, <laughs> for challenging me. Um, to to decide who I wanted to be and to take a stand in the world. So it is my absolute honor and privilege to be connected with you. Um, deeply grateful. I am grateful for the connection. Michael, to be invited to share. Uh, you know, I'm getting to this part of my career now uh, that I'm not going to be jumping on airplanes every day to go train like I used to. But I hope to impart some of what I've learned to people who can take it and do something with it. And, and it's just my deepest desire to give it away and give as much as I can away. And I'm so proud of what you're doing and taking the commitment to make the biggest differences as possible for as many people as possible. I just sincerely thank you and acknowledge you and honor you for what you're up to. And anyone who's listening to this, this man is a believer. This man is doing it from his heart. Uh, open yourself to what he has to share with you and take it sincerely. Don't make it so heavy. <laughs> Laugh about it a little too. Absolutely. And, have, some and fun. have a little fun with it. Absolutely. But thank you, Michael. And this has been a pleasure in full circle, my friend. Absolutely. Well, again, I want to close with a simple quote. This is, this is the quote that's been driving me for the past 30 years, and it's simple. It says, I will do today what others won't, so I can do tomorrow what others can't. Think about that. So thank you, Ray. We appreciate you, man. We'll definitely be in touch because we're, we're just getting warmed up, my friend. We're just, we're just getting warmed up. All right. We'll see you guys next episode. Take care. Thank you.